Chapter 49 The Last Words of Joshua This chapter is based on Joshua 23 and 24. The wars and conquest ended, Joshua had withdrawn to the peaceful retirement of his home at Timnath Sarah. And it came to pass, a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers. Some years had passed since the people had settled in their possessions, and already could be seen cropping out the same evils that had heretofore brought judgments upon Israel. As Joshua felt the infirmities of age stealing upon him, and realized that his work must soon close, he was filled with anxiety for the future of his people. It was with more than a father's interest that he addressed them, as they gathered once more about their aged chief. Ye have seen, he said, all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Although the Canaanites had been subdued, they still possessed a considerable portion of the land promised to Israel. And Joshua exhorted his people not to settle down at ease and forget the Lord's command to utterly dispossess these idolatrous nations. The people in general were slow to complete the work of driving out the heathen. The tribes had dispersed to their possessions, the army had disbanded, and it was looked upon as a difficult and doubtful undertaking to renew the war. But Joshua declared, the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left. Joshua appealed to the people themselves as witnesses that so far as they had complied with the conditions, God had faithfully fulfilled His promises to them. Ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls, he said, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. He declared to them that as the Lord had fulfilled His promises, so he would fulfill his threatenings. It shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things. When ye have transgressed the covenant of the Lord, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and ye shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Satan deceives many with the plausible theory that God's love for his people is so great that he will excuse sin in them. He represents that while the threatenings of God's word are to serve a certain purpose in his moral government, they are never to be literally fulfilled. But in all his dealings with his creatures, God has maintained the principles of righteousness by revealing sin in its true character, by demonstrating that its sure result is misery and death. The unconditional pardon of sin never has been and never will be. Such pardon would show the abandonment of the principles of righteousness, which are the very foundation of the government of God. It would fill the unfallen universe with consternation. God has faithfully pointed out the results of sin, and if these warnings were not true, how could we be sure that His promises would be fulfilled? That so-called benevolence which would set aside justice is not benevolence, but weakness. God is the life-giver. From the beginning all His laws were ordained to life. But sin broke in upon the order that God had established, and discord followed. So long as sin exists, suffering and death are inevitable. It is only because the Redeemer has borne the curse of sin in our behalf that man can hope to escape, in his own person, its dire results. Before the death of Joshua, the heads and representatives of the tribes, obedient to his summons, again assembled at Shechem. No spot in all the land possessed so many sacred associations, carrying their minds back to God's covenant with Abraham and Jacob, and recalling also their own solemn vows upon their entrance into Canaan. 
Here were the mountains Ebal and Gerizim, the silent witnesses of those vows which now, in the presence of their dying leader, they had assembled to renew. On every side were evidences of what God had wrought for them, how He had given them a land for which they did not labor, and cities which they built not, vineyards and olive yards which they planted not. Joshua reviewed once more the history of Israel, recounting the wonderful works of God that all might have a sense of His love and mercy and might serve Him in sincerity and in truth. By Joshua's direction, the ark had been brought from Shiloh. The occasion was one of great solemnity, and this symbol of God's presence would deepen the impression he wished to make upon the people. After presenting the goodness of God toward Israel, he called upon them in the name of Jehovah to choose whom they would serve. The worship of idols was still to some extent secretly practiced, and Joshua endeavored now to bring them to a decision that should banish this sin from Israel. If it seem evil unto you to serve Jehovah, he said, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Joshua desired to lead them to serve God, not by compulsion, but willingly. Love to God is the very foundation of religion. To engage in His service merely from hope of reward or fear of punishment would avail nothing. Open apostasy would not be more offensive to God than hypocrisy and mere formal worship. The aged leader urged the people to consider, in all its bearings, what he had set before them, and to decide if they really desired to live as did the degraded idolatrous nations around them. If it seemed evil to them to serve Jehovah, the source of power, the fountain of blessing, let them that day choose whom they would serve. The gods which your fathers served, from whom Abraham was called out, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. These last words were a keen rebuke to Israel. The gods of the Amorites had not been able to protect their worshipers. Because of their abominable and debasing sins, that wicked nation had been destroyed, and the good land which they once possessed had been given to God's people. What folly for Israel to choose the deities for whose worship the Amorites had been destroyed. As for me and my house, said Joshua, we will serve Jehovah. The same holy zeal that inspired the leader's heart was communicated to the people. His appeals called forth the unhesitating response, God forbid that we should forsake Jehovah to serve other gods. Ye cannot serve the Lord, said Joshua, for he is a holy God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Before there could be any permanent reformation, the people must be led to feel their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God. They had broken his law, it condemned them as transgressors, and it provided no way of escape. While they trusted in their own strength and righteousness, it was impossible for them to secure the pardon of their sins. They could not meet the claims of God's perfect law, and it was in vain that they pledged themselves to serve God. It was only by faith in Christ that they could secure pardon of sin and receive strength to obey God's law. They must cease to rely upon their own efforts for salvation. They must trust wholly in the merits of the promised Savior, if they would be accepted of God. Joshua endeavored to lead his hearers to weigh well their words and refrain from vows which they would be unprepared to fulfill. With deep earnestness they repeated the declaration, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Solemnly consenting to the witness against themselves that they had chosen Jehovah, they once more reiterated their pledge of loyalty, the Lord our God will we serve, and His voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Having written an account of this solemn transaction, he placed it with the book of the law in the side of the ark, and he set up a pillar as a memorial, saying, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, 
lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. Joshua's work for Israel was done. He had wholly followed the Lord. And in the book of God he is written, The Servant of Jehovah. The noblest testimony to his character as a public leader is the history of the generation that had enjoyed his labors. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua.